Blood on the Clock Tower belongs to the werewolf family of games. Loads of good players who don't know who each other are versus a team of evil players who do know who each other are. And this is the kicker, everyone has special powers. You've got townsfolk, good players with special powers that are straight up helpful to the good team. Outsiders, who are also good, but their special powers are a hindrance to the good team. Minions, bad players whose special powers mess with the good team. And their leader, the demon. There are a whole bunch of different demons in the full game, but for this specific scenario we'll be playing, that demon will be the Imp. Like Werewolf, there are two phases to the game, night and day. At night, the Imp will kill a member of the town, and other players' special powers may also activate at night to give them information on who other people might be. Then, during the day, everyone discusses what they know, with evil players lying their asses off. If they want to, players can nominate other players during the day that they think might be evil, for execution, at which point a vote happens. Living players can vote every time. Dead players may not have their power anymore, but can still speak and can also vote. But they can only do it once per game, spending it like an extra life or one last bullet in the chamber to try and kill off an evil player. Good players win the game if they execute the demon. Bad players win if there are only two people left alive and one of those is the demon. That is the overview of the game. The ones that say you start knowing only get information on night one, which was last night. If you're one of those guys, you've got all the info that you're going to get for the whole game. John the chef, the <laughs> humble chef. We will tell John how many pairs of evil players are sat next to each other. As you can see, this game is, is a big old circle. If we were playing this in real life, everyone would be sat around in a circle. Uh, and players that are sat next to each other are considered to be neighbours or neighbouring players. Mm. So on, on the first night, we will tell John how many of those baddies are sat next to each other. So, Laurie, you are the librarian, the library man, if you will, for long-time <laughs> fans of Laurie Blake content. And so, on this, the first night's sleep, as you lock up the library before heading home to your bed, you notice only one book has been borrowed this entire past week. And that book is Moonshining 101. And the two villagers who have borrowed it are Blair and Ollie, which can, of course, only mean one thing. Blair or Ollie is the drunk. Excellent. Uh, John will be this game's washerwoman. Uh, it's what we call a, a first night info role. So on the first night of the game, we'll wake up John and tell him that one of two people is a particular townsfolk. As you can see from our reminder tokens here, we've decided that we're going to tell John that either Laurie or Brooke is the fortune teller. Because obviously, like, a lot of us won't want to say right away. Yeah, because there's that whole sort of middle tier of roles, right? Like, yeah. That, that you don't want the demon to know who you are. Right. The Undertaker is such a powerful role that it is literally a core mechanic in most of the social deduction games. Uh, if the town executes someone, so if they vote someone out of the game during the day, we will wake up Isaac at night and tell him who that play what character that player was playing as. Blair will be this game's fortune teller. It's a very powerful role. Each night, Blair will wake up and choose two players. If one of them is the demon, we will tell Blair, yes, you have found the demon. If neither of them is the demon, we will tell Blair, no. However, there is one good player in this circle <laughs> that will also register as the demon to Blair. So there's one inbuilt red herring. More on that later. God, this game hates its players in such the <laughs> in such the best way. Uh, absolutely. Uh, just to clarify as well, uh, fortune tellers do not register minions. Only the demon. Only Luke and indeed uh, Blair's one red herring. Absolutely. Uh, Tom is the monk. Each night, Tom will wake up and pick someone. They are safe from the demon. The demon cannot kill them. Uh, unfortunately for Tom, he cannot pick himself which means he's going to have to be careful because if he comes out and says, hey, I'm the monk, who wants protecting? Guess who's going to die tonight? Probably Tom. Yeah. Each night, the empath wakes up and learns how many of their alive neighbours are evil. As you can see, Isaac is currently sat between two good players and Isaac is neither poisoned nor drunk. So as things stand, 
Isaac will learn that neither of his living neighbours are evil. If Sully or Laurie dies, then he will be checking on the next neighbour along because it's only living neighbours. It's an extremely powerful role. It's also a role that's very open to tampering with. So I think Isaac is going to be very power... Blah, blah, blah. Very paranoid is what I was looking for there. Ollie is the Raven Keeper. If Ollie is attacked by Luke in the night and dies, Ollie will get to wake up, point at someone, and learn what character they are. It's a very powerful role because there are very, very few ways to properly discover what other people's characters are Indeed. in this game. And uh, he's going to he's gonna want to be cagey about that because if Luke finds out that Ollie's the Raven Keeper, he is not going to want to kill him because... Basically, Ollie's kind of got a loaded gun at that point if he's attacked in the night. Absolutely. It's going to be... It's it's very important that Ollie doesn't simply come out and state that he's the Raven Keeper. Otherwise, evil will definitely not kill him in the night. Blair is the Slayer. The Slayer's ability is that they... Once per game, they can at any time during the day just stand up and say, I'm the Slayer and I shoot this person. And if the person they shoot is a demon, a.k.a. in this case the Imp, that player dies immediately so Blair can literally instantly end the game if she picks the right person interestingly there's nobody else in this circle who might die if picked except the imp a, a, a character like the recluse might die because they can register as a demon but there's no recluse in here so it's literally pick the right player win the game for Blair huge huge ability huge potential for awesome plays Laurie is this game's soldier soldier is a very simple role you are safe from the demon at night, basically. So if Carly picks picks Laurie to kill, Laurie won't die. There will be no deaths in the night. Unless, of course, Laurie has been poisoned by the poisoner. Um, Ollie is the Virgin. Uh, the Virgin is an extremely powerful role if you know how to use it correctly. The Virgin's ability reads the first time you're nominated, if the nominator is a townsfolk, they are executed. So to put that into, into simpler terms, when we get to the point where we vote for people, the first person to nominate Ollie, if that person is a townsfolk, will immediately be executed, die, and will all go straight to sleep. So that actually sounds awful, but in fact it's very useful in a game where so much information can be messed with through drunkenness and poisoning. The Virgin is an incredibly powerful character because it is one of the few sources of absolute guaranteed factual information. If Ollie's ability goes off and kills someone, Ollie is the Virgin. There is no way that he can not be the Virgin, and that's one ninth of the puzzle solved in a heartbeat. And finally, the big man in town. <laughs> Sully, the mayor. So I, I absolutely adore the mayor. It's such a cool role. Um, the mayor is one of the most social characters in this script, in my opinion. It's a, it's a simple ability. If you can stay alive until there are only three people left alive and then convince the town not to execute anyone, the mayor, along with the good team, will win. It's a very difficult thing to do. It sounds like you're lying when you do it. Uh, and it will, it will, Sully will have to convince people not to kill, which is, you know, frankly, what this game's all about. But if you can pull that off, good will just win by default. It's also worth noting that if if the mayor is attacked in the night, someone else might die instead. So we can, as storytellers, as as GMs, forcibly keep Sully in the game, providing he's not drunk or poisoned, regardless of what happens in the night. It is, as a player, it is my favourite role to play as. I love being. There's something about small town government that is just always fun to play as in any game setting. And I genuinely love being the mayor and just being a being a big shot. And having that, that added layer of safety as well, I think, is, is really enjoyable. Feeling that if people try to try to gun for you, um, that you are vindicated eventually in defending yourself no matter what happens, which is a satisfying feeling. The Saint is our second outsider. This uh, nine-player game should contain two outsiders. That's one of the rules of setup. Uh, and the Saint's ability is that if they are executed, they and their team immediately lose. 
That is only execution, though. Luke can die at night. Luke can be killed by the imp, by the evil team in the night, and that's fine. And in fact, I imagine Luke will want to try and orchestrate that, and he may employ a strategy very similar to that of the Raven Keeper. But if Luke is executed during the day, the game is over and the evil team wins. Sullivan is the drunk. Sullivan will believe that he is the empath. The empath's ability is that they learn how many of their two neighbors, or sorry, how many of their two alive neighbors are evil. As you can see, Sully is currently sat between a good guy and an evil guy, so Sully should get a 1. However, Sully is not really the empath, Sully is actually the drunk, as you can see by a little drunk reminder token we've got there. So we will be giving Sully false information for the entire <laughs> game because he is drunk. <laughs> and he will be drunk for the whole game, and it will be hilarious. Yes! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trust me, guys. He's really nice. He's a really lovely bloke. <laughs> I say it. I say he's a really nice guy. Oh, amazing. We, okay. Me and Luke knew that on round one. Uh, then Elliot. Oh, the recluse is such a pain yes. in the ass. So, I, I love the recluse. I think it's one of my favourite characters. So, Elliot's power as the recluse, is that he he may register as evil or as a minion or as a demon. Now, uh, that sounds complicated, but it's actually very simple. What that means is when somebody else's character is interacting with the recluse, their powers may be messed with in such a way as to make Elliot look evil. Uh, it's really that simple. Now, that sounds awful at first glance, but actually uh, it can be quite useful because if somebody comes up to Elliot and says, hey, I think you're evil, I've seen that you're evil, Elliot could say, well, do you know what? I believe you because I'm the recluse and, and it's perfectly reasonable that you might think that. So while it does put Elliot in the firing line, it actually gives Elliot a unique way to gather information. I love the butler. The butler's one of those roles where, on first glance, people are tempted to, to be like, oh, that's, that's not a very good role. That's not really doing very much, is it? Uh, the butler's ability is that each night they choose someone to be their master, and they may only vote if their master votes or is going to vote. So they're not obliged to vote when their master votes, but they're not allowed to put their hand up unless their master has their hand up. Uh, so a lot of people look at that role and think that's a handicap. It's actually awesome because A, you're focusing on when people are voting, which is a huge deal in Blood on the Clock Tower. Noticing people's voting patterns is can be a massive boon to the team. And B... It basically frees you from having to worry about when you vote, which itself is a huge boon. Because as the butler, when people say, why are you voting on that person? Or why didn't you vote on that person? Your response is, hey, I'm the butler. And if you die, who cares? You're the butler. Now you can vote whenever you want. So it's a very freeing role, and it's a great role for people who like to play the social game rather than the mechanical game, I would say. minions are basically there to back up the demon. Uh, the Scarlet Woman's ability is that if there are five or more players alive and the demon dies, the Scarlet Woman becomes the new demon. So the Scarlet Woman is basically a safety net for the evil team. If Luke gets topped off in the uh, in the early game, Laurie will take over by default. Absolutely. And there are nine alive players at the start. So uh, Laurie's power is active for a good while. So intrepid Adam is our spy. Adam is the minion, uh, one half of the evil team. The spy's ability is that they get to look inside the grimoire every night. Now, the grimoire is this view that you guys are seeing now, these nine character tokens and all the reminder tokens and stuff that we have on screen. That is the grimoire. So, Adam, every single night, will get to see absolutely everything that's going on. Who everyone is, who's drunk, who's poisoned, who his imp is about to kill, and all of the all of the decisions that we've made, Adam will be aware of. It's an extremely powerful role. Your immediate thoughts hearing that might be, wow, that's too powerful, but actually it, it can be a double-edged sword because if the evil team start picking off the most valuable players in order of most valuable, it'll become quite obvious to the good guys very quickly that we, in fact, have a spy in the game. Um... Isaac is the poisoner. Each night, Isaac will wake up and choose someone to poison. For the next night and day, that person's ability will not work properly. So, in real terms, what that means is if that person is a role that does something, it simply won't happen. If they are a role that learns information in the night, then Tom and I will be able to lie to them if we, if we want to. 
And when I say if we want to, generally we will lie to them because, you know, we don't want to take someone's ability away. But you can tell the truth to a poison player if you deem it necessary. Just I don't quick know anything. Quick question, What's everyone. Up? Um, <laughs> I just want to know if anyone can own up to being an outsider. Uh, just because if we have at least three, then we know we've got a Baron in play. Um, mm. That's good. So that'd be useful. Mm. I can tell you that I'm not an outsider. Helpful like. stuff. Carly will be this game's imp. Uh, the imp is basically the evil team captain. Uh, each night the imp wakes up and chooses someone to die. Uh, the imp can also choose themselves and, and pass it on to a minion if they wish. Uh, but yeah, basically the game is over if Carly dies. And the game is won for the evil team if there are only two players left alive and one of them is Carly. So, you know, very important that Carly stays alive. I'm pretty sure there is no way, unless I'm missing something, that Carly can be evil based on the fact that she gave me the role that she is before I said what I knew. No, it is on. impossible to exceed those five votes. It is impossible for Isaac to not be executed. So I would like to announce that Isaac is executed and dies and give my congratulations to the evil team yes! who just absolutely oh, hi guys. You. I knew it oh, I knew it right at the end there with yep. the luckiest bluff in the world <laughs> <laughs>